the heart of art, scoping the Brussels Valley for the best artists and bringing them to your radio. Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome back to the Kimi Studios. My name is Hector Nino and you're listening to The Heart of Art. We have a great show planned for you today. Our guest today will be Luke Knowles. He is a hairstylist and a painter. And we have an interesting conversation about how these two forms of art uh, interact. And he is also an ag who is opening a barber shop uh, here in Bryan. So, um, yeah, we talk a little bit about what this business is going to be like and what he views for, for that future. And then for the second part of our show, we will also revisit uh, my interview with Dr. Mark Sadowski. He is a landscape photographer and he has a great eye. He recently had an exhibition at the gallery. Even though it is not up right now, it is proof that his work is really good. So yeah, we have a great conversation about uh, what camera he uses and uh, how it is that he gets these amazing shots. All right, and now for our, our announcements. We have the J. Wayne Stark Gallery currently has a an exhibition called Natural Selections, Animals in Art. And this is all about flora, fauna, and wildlife through different styles, whether they be, you know, very accurate depictions of these animals or uh, an expressive form. Uh, and they observe nature through the eyes of 35 artists from the 19th and 20th century. So if you are interested in this, make sure to go uh, to the J. Wayne Stark Galleries in the MSC 1110 room that's in the first floor. And it is currently now up until September 4th of this year. So make sure to go check it out before it goes away. And for a second announcement, I did want to welcome all of the new and returning students. I hope you all had a great summer and I hope you all are staying safe. And um, you, I hope you're ready for a new uh, semester of work. And uh, I hope you, that you are still able to make some art while you are working here uh, in classes. Speaking about students, I did want to uh, highlight the it is going to be Howdy Week next week. So there we there will be a pop up exhibition where you can go and make uh, art that you can show right then and there that is going to be exhibited at the Forsyth Galleries. Um, so you can go to the Forsyth Galleries on Tuesday, August twenty third. And this is a an event hosted by the University Art Gallery. So you can go and cool down uh, and make some art that could be maybe uh, exhibited right then and there. Those are all the announcements I had for today. And, uh, well, let's start the show, and I hope you enjoy. Today in the KMU Studios, we have a special guest. His name is Luke Knowles. Uh, he is a hairstylist and barber, but is also a painter and co-owner of CrossFit Obey. Uh, he's also building a brand that involves, quote, hair, fashion, m- men's mental, and physical health. So, hi, Luke. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm really uh, interested by this brand that you're building. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what that is? Yeah, so it's, um, it's called 101 Barber Company. Mm-hmm. So I just established it recently, and I'm actually opening a barber shop on November 1st in Bryan, Texas. Awesome. Wow. That's, that sounds really yeah. exciting. Um, well, before we go into your art, I do like to go through the background of my guests first and figure out where that love for art started. So I did want to ask you, where were you raised and what environment fostered this creativity that you have? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm from Magnolia, Texas. Right. Shout out to the homies. Mm-hmm. My mom has been a mixed media artist Uh since years before I was born. Uh, Their dream house that they built about 16 years ago in Magnolia in River Park Ranch um, has about a 400 square foot art studio in it. Wow. Where my mom spun pottery and she even had a kiln in there for a little while. Um, She's done woodworking, she's done calligraphy, watercolor, acrylic, oil. Uh, I mean, mixed media to true to form where she would do pieces that are you know, incorporating 15, 20 different materials and hundreds of techniques, you know, so she's done everything. It's always in that kind of environment for a long time. And to make a long story short, uh, my mom definitely inspired my creativity. And in high school, I was in art classes and it was so rigorous and going over the color wheel was beyond boring whenever I was watching my mom throw you know pottery on a canvas and do all this mixed media cool stuff at home and so I quit art and that's when I started cutting hair and that's where my kind of artistic you know that's where my artistry kind of found its home 
Oh, so for because a while. of hairstyling, you kind of went back to your creativity yeah. side. Awesome. That's interesting. And so did you not really see yourself as a hairstylist growing up? Like, did you ever see that as a possibility for yourself? No, not at all. I was cutting hair for my little brother. He came home from sports clips, had a bad haircut, and I just gave him a buzz cut, basically. Nice. And that's where it all started. That's where it all started. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I remember having great experiences growing up uh, with my hairstylist. So I I don't know. I have really good experiences with them. Um when did you begin painting? Was it, I mean, from as long as you yeah. can remember because your mom was doing it? Or off and on, yeah, yeah, off and on from as, as young as I can remember. Mm -hmm. and my mom and dad, just like most parents, save their kids' art, you know. Right. And, uh, yeah, I mean, as, as long as I can remember. But I started taking it seriously again. I don't know. I've been cutting hair for 11 years now, three years professionally, and about two years ago, the artistry of cutting hair kind of lost its you know, gusto in my mind mm -hmm. and hair really became more about like social interaction. And I realized that what I was providing was more of an experience and less of a service. The service is obviously important. You know, right. I want right. to make sure that everyone's getting exactly what they want, um, exceeding their expectations when it comes to the service. But the conversation and who I am as a person, I think is really what makes the package worth the price. Right. Um, and so anyway, in whenever I was kind of thinking in that vein, that's whenever the creativity of it lost its edge a little bit in my mind, and so I picked up a paintbrush again and started painting. Awesome. Yeah. And um, did, you said you started a barber school here in College Station? Was in it? Bryan. In yeah, Bryan. Yeah, okay. in Institute of Modern Barbering is what it was called, okay. owned by uh, Jessica and Ramsey. And uh, it's actually in, it's formerly Institute of Modern Barbering. Now it's Institute of uh, Barbering and Beauty. All right. Yeah. And from your experience there, would you recommend th that to others? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, definitely. All right. Um, you know, that focus on your brand and men's mental health, why, why do you think that's important to focus on men's mental health? Well, Sorry. I mean, it's important. Yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> I, I mean... Uh, and it, it doesn't get spoken about uh, yeah. as much, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've fostered an environment, like I was, I kind of alluded to earlier, the the product that I bring to the table is more is less than is more than just a good haircut, you know. Mm -hmm. Of course, I have a competitively um, excellent haircut, um, but what I really bring to the table is fostering an environment where people can feel heard, and mm -hmm. and they listen too. You know, it's like this two way street where we're sharing and caring and responding to each other's hurts and you know empathizing with each other's weaknesses and burdens and and so anyway in that environment it's not unique to my chair it's very uh uh common among like hair styling as you alluded to earlier right, right. Mm -hmm. um and so essentially the brand i want to build is more than just good haircuts you know i want to replicate myself in the fact that i'm doing more than just cutting hair I'm, you know yeah it's an experience yeah. as well and i mean the way you're describing it, it sounds even like therapy even <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. you're both like I, releasing your your stresses and traumas yeah. you know i'm um, no licensed therapist or doctor or have any right. accolades to put behind my name but i just care about people and hear, hear what they're doing you know mm -hmm. how would you describe your painting style for people who can't see it through the radio i think considering my experience and the things i've been exposed to with my mom's skills i would say it's definitely like uh it's mixed media so i mean i can I can do lots of things, uh, but I think what I really am most passionate about, what I've really honed in on is if someone has a vision, like they have like uh, a vision is too ambiguous. If they have like some inspiration, like some lyrics, or they have some inspiration, like an old photo of family or something like that, mm -hmm. and they want me to represent it through abstract art, you know, wow. it's less of a square on a painting uh, on a canvas that, and more of like, I want to have like 40 elements in in the painting that, you know, each have a uh, significance that pertains to their inspiration, right? So, mm -hmm. and then with each painting, I want to have and have had each of those items explained, the significance explained, so that they can look at the paper and say, oh, I know exactly what that means, right? And so they can reflect on it after purchasing the painting. So it's more about like the the significance behind the imagery yeah. for you, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I noticed on your Instagram you had a piece with, like, gold flakes and, like, oh, yeah. Elmer's glue. So that's, yeah. like, really cool that you in incorporate all those different elements. Yeah. Would you say that your painting affects your hairstyling or, and or yeah. vice versa? Yeah, absolutely. I cut, hair and, I cut hair and paint in a very similar way hmm. in that um, 
there's like forms and like uh, parameters, you know, but when it comes to like finalizing the details, I don't have, I don't cut hair in a way that's like, all right, I'm going to use this one and then this two and then this three and then in this area, I'm going to use scissors. It's like, I'm going to make this outline and then whatever tool is closest to me, I just kind of grab that and then boom, 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 you know, I like, it's really hard for me to teach <laughs> yeah. because my style of cutting hair is very like artisan, you know, it's less of a formula and, and painting yeah. is very similar too. like, like the mo the painting that you referenced earlier, um, it has the black box it's surrounded by, uh, gold leaf and you know, various other pen, magic marker, you know, liquid nail all kinds of other mixed mixed media materials mm -hmm. um yeah i started with a form and then literally left it there for a week and then i would look i, I would look at it on the easel as i walked through my house until i had until i realized what's the next thing i want to add mm -hmm. instead of like planning it out on an ipad and then painting it or just you know so you take your time yeah i take painting. my time yeah instead of just busting it out in an hour or something right mm -hmm. and how, how long does it take you or would you say on average to create like a full hairstyle Oh, I do every haircut in less than 45 minutes. 45 minutes. So wow. that's every haircut, like purely just the haircut, you mm -hmm. know, uh, that I can do any haircut pr in less than 30 minutes. No problem. Wow. And then all the other services included, max would be 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And what are all those other services that you offer? Oh, like beards, eyebrows, uh, getting into skincare. I have a really awesome skincare line by yeah. a company called Arbonne. Mm. And... Uh, Derm Results is the line. They have a few different lines, but yeah, it's all organic, plant-based. Shout out to my wife. She sells it. Sounds I use good. it, love it. All my clients are looking for something good. So. And what's the name of it again? It's called Arbon. A-R-B-O-N-N-E, I believe. N -N -E, okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. What would you say you find most satisfying about hairstyling? Um, well, me and you have a similar haircut. It's mm -hmm. kind of like a mohawk, but yeah. it's also kind of like a mullet. But it's also like a crop kind of in the front because we let it hang over our forehead, you know. But then it's mm -hmm. also like a taper on the sides. Like, so there's a lot of different elements going on in your style and my style, which is funny. We have almost the same haircut right yeah, now. Yeah, it's just um, <laughs> Great minds. Yeah. It's a, it's trending for sure. Yeah. But uh, I love a haircut that is like, it's so complex that a client can't ask for it. You mm -hmm. know, they have to show you a photo. Yeah. Whereas like something is... Uh, cookie cutter, no disrespect to anybody who does these styles. I do these styles too, but they're definitely not like something that I'm like want to advertise. Uh, it's just like a f regular bald fade, you know, where it's like skin above the ear all the way around or like a white wall on the side, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. It's like super cookie cutter and every barber should know how to do those haircuts. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. Those are money making haircuts, right? right? But the stuff sure. that I like to do and that I like to advertise and that I really want to hang my hat on is the stuff that's, like, super complex and fun. Stuff that, a, like, a typical barber would look at and say, what is, it? like, that's ugly, you know? You know what I mean? Confused. <laughs> I want to look at it. I want my client to be like, dude, I freaking love this. This is, like, super disheveled and funky. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like I did it at, my, at home by myself, but it's way better than that. Mm -hmm. And like, you truly can't get it anywhere else. Yeah. Right. Where do you see your brand expanding in the future? I think, well, so like I said, I'm, I just uh, signed a lease on a space in uh, Bryan right. off Sims. Mm -hmm. It's just two or three blocks away from uh, Kyle House where Polite Coffee is posted up. They they roast in-house, by the way. Shout out to them. Ooh, Big wow. fan. Okay. Always have been drinking their coffee for the last, like, three and a half years. But uh, it's just right down the street from there. And anyway, what I'm saying is uh, I signed the lease there, so I'll be opening up the shop. Um, I have an apprentice that I brought on about a year ago. His name's Clay DeJong. He's he's uh, less of an apprentice now, more of a barber who cuts with me because he's super legit. Awesome. And uh, it's actually amazing how much he's learned. I mean, he l didn't even pick up a pair of clippers until a year and a half ago, and now he's his haircuts are amazing. Great. But, uh, yeah, so I'll bring on a few more apprentices, maybe one or two at a time, and es essentially grow the shop into, you know, maybe like six, seven barbers max. Mm -hmm. My goal is to own a shop uh, for this brand that is much less of a 30-chair, 20-chair shop that's like everybody's doing as many cuts as they can and instead have like seven barbers max where we're charging a lot more, but we're giving you way more time, way more attention. All the barbers are making even more than they would if they were working at a chop shop like that and have a space on top of that dedicated to like selling art, socializing, doing pop-up events for coffee tastings and whiskey tastings and maybe even like 
small sets, standing room only, acoustic concerts, things like that. That'd be awesome, yeah. Yeah, really bring, because what I've noticed, I'm going off on a tangent here, but <laughs> you could. essentially, I mean, that's what this is for, right? Yeah, of course. Essentially, the concept of 101 Barber Company is really taking it back like old school. Like barber shops used to be that third place, right? Starbucks coined this concept of having a third place, right? You got your workplace, you got your house, and then you got Starbucks, right? You go there not only just to get a coffee, but to use the free Wi-Fi, right? You sit, you post up mm -hmm. and you can socialize there, right? That's essentially what barbershops used to be before all that stuff happened. Men would go, they'd read the newspaper, they'd socialize, they'd, you know, they'd catch up on what's the local buzz and they would get a haircut and say, what's up and peace and they would leave, right? Mm -hmm. um, in modern culture, everybody's moving so fast, right? They they want an appointment so they can get in and they can get out, right? right? But if I if I if I really want to take it back old school, make barbering what it used to be, I think I have to be super intentional about the space in that I, there needs to be a space solely dedicated to the social aspect, right. right? Instead of just saying, "Hey, you guys can stay around if you want." I want to actually have a space that's like, "Oh no, literally, you can go vibe over there, use the free Wi-Fi, post up at the chair." You know, look at some art, right? Invite your friend. Even if they're not getting a haircut, you just hang out, you know? Right. Oh, I love that. Like, I, I don't think I've seen min much of that here in the area. So yeah. be, I think you'd be, like, the first to do it. Yeah, it's definitely a niche that I want to capture. And, and then long, long, long term, maybe franchise. That's okay. a big word. Mm -hmm. right? That's a big word, and that's a lot of dreaming. Ambition. And that's, ambition. that's a lot of ambition. Yes. Um, that but maybe franchise if i could right. if i could really master this concept i think that this is a concept that would be effective in any city mm -hmm. well yeah i mean if you're listening and you're interested in, in helping luke build his brand you know, contact uh, cuts by luke .com and you can find all the information there and when can they expect this store to reopen around where in november 1st november is uh is when okay. i'll be is when the lease is set to start Great. I might. I'll probably do a soft opening. Maybe have like a small acoustic concert and have some merch and stuff for sale to represent the brand. And then uh, either that week or the following week, I'll be up and rolling. Wow. Look, well, sounds exciting. Uh, yeah. I, I'm very excited for your future. I'm, I'm very excited to see where this brand goes. And thank you for stopping by and talking to me a little bit about it. Yeah, I appreciate it, Hector. No problem. Anytime. All right, guys, welcome back to the Heart of Art with Hector Nino. And now we will go on to my conversation with Mark Sadowski that we had on June 7th. Today in the studio, we have a very special guest. Uh, they are a retired professor here from Texas A&M and was once the director of educational research in the Texas A&M Health Science Center College of Medicine. Uh, but now they are a photographer and they like to... Um, capture immense earthly structures and they're amazing and his name is uh, Dr. Mark Sadowski. So hi Mark, how are you today? Hi Hector, I'm fine. Thank you for having me. Of course, thank you so much for stopping by. To start off, I like to go through the background of my guests and seeing where their love for art began. So I saw that uh, uh, you, a lot of your education was from Southern Connecticut. Is that is that correct? Yes, uh, my undergraduate and uh, master's degree were from Southern Connecticut State University, and I received my Ph.D. from the University of Connecticut. Uh, was this where your interest in photography started in Connecticut? Uh, yeah, actually, my interest in art in general um, started quite young, seven, eight, nine years old. Uh, I uh, exhibited some talent for freehand drawing. Oh, really? uh, yeah, I drew a lot. And my parents, who really could not well afford it, um, got me private art lessons uh, a couple of days a week. And I learned a lot about drawing and painting there. Um, I had four years of art in high school. Uh, and then when I went to college, um, I did not major or minor in art, but I took enough art courses so that I had the equivalent of a minor in art including courses in design, painting, ceramics, and so on. Awesome. So my formal background in the arts is um, pretty broad. Mm -hmm. I picked up photography uh, in college. Uh, it, was, it gained a lot of popularity at the time. And um, I, that was film days and uh, black and white film and had experiences of my own little dark room that I had in my apartment mm -hmm. and uh, got involved in photography that way. Awesome. 
later, um, I switched over to color slides and uh, because there was a local club that had color slide competitions. Mm -hmm. And I actually won some awards there and did pretty well in color slide competition. I guess a defining moment in my uh, interest in photography came in 1970 when um, I met the great landscape photographer Ansel Adams. Hmm. He uh, had an exhibit of his works at the, the uh, Yale Art Gallery in New Haven, Connecticut. And being interested in photography, I went down to see it and uh, fortunately uh, met Ansel Adams there. Um, hmm. He was just kind of standing at the opening of the place, and I guess I was early because uh, he came over and said hello and, you know, come right in, and he was very jovial and very nice. It's not like we had a long conversation or anything. Mm -hmm. But uh, the pictures there that I saw just were staggering. Um, and I started taking landscape photographs after that and um, went on to, you know, work in color, color slides. And uh, that's how my interest in that began. It was later on um, when digital photography took over from film that I got back into it. And my interest in landscape photography uh, persisted and I've been doing landscape photography as a hobby, kind of an uh, advanced amateur, I guess I'd call myself ever since. Wow, awesome. So as the technology changes, then you're kind of growing with technology as well, right? <laughs> I did, but mm -hmm. I, you know, it was interesting to have experienced the old film and darkroom right. days, and then slides, and then, uh, you know, much of what Lightroom and Photoshop do uh, today is sort of digital darkroom. Right. And that, that's actually a good way to describe it. Mm. I was wondering when they're moving from Connecticut to Texas, how how did that happen? How, what, why did you move to Texas? Well, um, when I got my PhD from the University of Connecticut, um, I started looking for jobs in academia, and mm -hmm. Texas A&M was one of the prime jobs that year, and, and uh, I moved to Texas and been here ever since. Awesome. And um, was the what your possibilities of what you could photograph change because of the landscape change? I bet must be very different from Connecticut and here. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Um, and I can't say that I spent a lot of time taking pictures around here in Texas when I moved, but there are. I mean, certainly the Big Bend is one location right. which is very scenic, uh, and there's other places that around in Texas, some of the state parks. Caddo Lake is a big uh, draw for photographers. I haven't been there yet, but I'm planning on going there soon. And have you always had that inclination to photographing landscape specifically, or was this something that you learned when you started photographing? Yeah, the landscape stuff largely came from Ansel Adams and other photographers. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps I had an, an early uh, influence on that because uh, in my home when I was growing up, we had as an awful lot of homes had, National Geographic magazine. Oh, yeah. And there's a lot, always plenty of uh, uh, landscapes and travel photography in there. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, we had a subscription to Arizona Highways. Someone in the family had been out to visit a relative in Arizona and was impressed with it and subscribed. So I was looking at these wonderful pictures of the West and uh, Arizona highways, and uh, my father actually had done some amateur photography. I think we had Popular Photography magazine in the house for a while. So I grew up looking at a lot of you know National Geographic type photos, Arizona highways type photos, almost all of which was landscape and nature stuff. So that's probably where it came from. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, I was wondering what your artistic process was like exactly, or how do you, um, do you see something that you th think might look good on camera, and how does that whole process work? Oh, uh, you do. One of the things about landscape photography is um, you get to go to beautiful places and often at beautiful times. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that the workshop provides is guides to take you to these places and uh, get you there when the light is good, okay. which typically is... Uh, dusk and dawn. Mm -hmm. That's when uh, landscape photographers are out the most. Right. And the golden um, hour. Yeah, once you get there, then um, you know your eye for composition takes over. And a lot of my background training in art and you know, painting, and right. I certainly looked at a lot of pictures over the years, and still do. 
that kind of takes over. The formal training helps, but just kind of knowing the kind of pictures that other photographers get helps a lot as well. That's kind of intuitive. So a lot of my compositions are intuitive. Um, I can't say that I plan a whole lot. You go to places and you start to look around and say, whoa, that caught my eye and that would make a really good picture. And a lot of times um, you're there before sunrise. So you wait and see if the light develops and what you get for clouds in the sky and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And Hector, it's just beautiful to be there yeah. Some of these places. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it's cold. Mm -hmm. And some days it's even wet. Mm -hmm. But just to be out in nature in these beautiful places is um, quite a thing. Taking the pictures is almost gravy. Right. That's the easy part. <laughs> um, I was actually wanting to ask you if you had any interesting stories about these places you've been to, whether it be close encounters that you've had with some fa fauna or maybe uh, some people that you've met along the way. Um, I, I don't know that I have a very interesting uh, tale to tell. A couple of the pictures that I've gotten were from uh, places where people don't go very often. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite pictures is from a place called False Kiva. And what the False Kiva is, is a place in Canyonlands National Park, which is in an alcove in the side of a cliff. Hmm. Somewhere in ancient times, a ring of stones about eight feet wide was built there. Mm -hmm. I imagine this alcove or a little cave in the side of a cliff, it's about as big as a two-car garage with this ring of stones in the middle of it. And if you stand in the back and look across that ring of stones, you get the most staggering panorama out there across Canyonlands National Park with all these mesas and you know the canyons down below. And, but it's a little difficult to get there. You don't want to go there alone, A, because you get lost, and B, because you have to climb up the side of a cliff. Right. I was wondering how you get there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making it sound worse than it was, but you, but you actually do have to climb hand over hand. Wow. So usually you go there with a couple of people and, you know, you take off your gear and somebody climbs up and then you hand up your gear and then you climb up and, you know, get inside the alcove and just hope you get good sky, good light, uh, and that kind of thing. And, and uh, that's one place that I went, which was uh, a little bit risky, and few people go there and photograph that. I've had a couple of experiences like that, which I guess are highlights. All right, you guys, that is the show for today. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you so much to Luke Knowles for stopping by and uh, talking to me a little bit about his brand and what his future is. And I did want to remind you to email theheartofart at tamu.edu if you know of any artists or any art events that you'd like to, to promote here on the show. Uh, have a great week, and make sure to tune in next week. I'm Hector Nino, and you've been listening to The Heart of Art, a production of 90.9 KAMU-FM. You can find all of our shows anytime at kamu.tamu.edu.